Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Tom Heinrich, and I'm a veteran Israeli journalist. I will be your MC this morning. On October 7th, more than 1,200 Israelis were slaughtered by Hamas terrorists. More than 300 of them were women. Some of these women were murdered twice. The first time, when bloodthirsty Hamas terrorists committed shocking acts of sexual violence against them. They abused Israeli women. They mutilated Israeli women. They raped Israeli women. In certain cases, they did so in front of their loved ones. The second time these women were murdered was when terrorists put a bullet in them. In at least one case, this happened simultaneously. Let that sink in. Today, you will hear abundant evidence of these atrocities. Because as I said, these women were murdered two times. We will not allow for a third time to take place through denial and neglect, a refusal to acknowledge and grieve them. Today, we will screen their story, for there cannot be silence in the face of such atrocities. The video we are about to show you was released on November 25th, the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. On October 7th, Hamas committed crimes against humanity. They raped, murdered, and violated Israeli women. Hamas had committed rapes. We saw bodies of naked women. War workers say the bodies show trauma consistent with rape. They burned someone down when they realized he was raping them, and then he shot them in the head. The panther pulled down and she had half naked. No rapes. We spread them. Today, November 25th, is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And women's organizations chose to be silent against Hamas violence. By remaining silent, you are endorsing the atrocities committed against Israeli women on October 7th. Take a stand. Speak out against violence directed at women. I would now like to invite His Excellency, Mr. Gilad Erdan, Israel's Ambassador to the United Nations, for his opening remarks. Distinguished colleagues, members of Congress, women's rights leaders, friends, I want to thank you all for joining us today. I especially want to thank Sheryl Sandberg, Hadassah, Witzo, the National Council of Jewish Women, the World Zionist Organization, and Interwoven Shazul. Without your efforts, today's event would not have been possible. Friends, on October 7th, Israel suffered the most brutal massacre since the Holocaust. The atrocities committed by Hamas were more barbaric than ISIS. Some say more cruel and barbaric than the Nazis. Babies were murdered and beheaded. Families were bound together and burnt alive. Children were executed in front of their parents and parents in front of their children. But tragically, Hamas's heinous war crimes and crimes against humanity did not end there. On October 7th, Hamas perpetrated rape and sexual violence, exploiting these unforgivable crimes as weapons of war. These were not merely sick, spare-of-the-moment decisions of defi to defile and mutilate Israeli women and girls, to parade their naked bodies in the street while onlookers cheered. This 
was premeditated. This was planned. This was instructed. Hamas terrorists were told to commit these acts of sheer evil in order to terrorize us and our families, in order to drive us away from Israel out of fear. This is the enemy that we are facing. An enemy that views reprehensible gender-based violence as part of their genocidal war against Israel. An enemy that proudly weaponizes the cruelest forms of sadism. An enemy that views Israelis not as human beings, but as vermin. This is precisely why such evil must be eradicated. Hamas has no place among humanity. Today, we will hear how women of all ages, from young girls to grandmothers, were not spared. We will hear of violence that is absolutely unthinkable. We will hear the voices of those who can no longer tell their stories. And this is why today's event is of the utmost importance. Sadly, the very international bodies that are supposedly the defenders of all women showed that when it comes to Israelis, indifference is acceptable. To these organizations, Israeli women are not women. The rape of Israelis is not an act of rape. Their silence has been deafening. I even sent photos, photo evidence, of Hamas's crimes in two separate letters to UN women, which have both been ignored. Only two days ago, nearly two months, two months after Hamas's massacre, as UN women showed an ounce, ounce of recognition, but it is, this is too little, too late. UN women ignored all of the proof and, and were blind to all the evidence, including video footage of clear testimonies of sexual crimes. Instead of immediately supporting the victims, UN women brazenly suggested that Hamas's gender-based violence be investigated by a blatantly anti-Semitic UN body. This is UN women's response. So I will state clearly today, the investigation that truly must be carried out is an investigation of UN women's indifference to the heinous crimes against Israeli women. Although this is heartbreaking, not only for Israelis, but for all women, we must not despair. Look around you. Look at this room. It's overflowing with steadfast leadership and unbreakable values. Every person here is willing to stand up to immorality and vile crimes, to hear the stories of the victims who can no longer tell them, and to amplify their voices worldwide. Despite the short notice, we received overwhelming support for this event. This is an immense source of inspiration, and it empowers women everywhere. If the UN chooses to remain silent in the face of evil, that doesn't mean the world will follow suit. If the top-down approach is broken, the bottom-up approach will prevail. The world will know the truth. We know the truth, and we will make the truth heard. The stories of Israeli women will not be silenced. The truth will prevail, and justice will be brought. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Erdan. Our next speaker is Ms. Sheila Katz, CEO of National Council of Jewish Women, a 130-year-old Jewish feminist civil rights organization with over 200,000 advocates working for the full equity and safety of women, children, and families in the United States and Israel. Sheila.
Welcome, everyone. We gather today to shed light on the gravity of the rape and brutal sexual assault inflicted upon Israeli women by Hamas terrorists on October 7th. Excuse me. We gather to advocate for accountability. We gather to convene the hearing that UN women should have held weeks ago. I'm heartened, though not surprised, by the overwhelming response that's visible in this room today and for all the tens of thousands of people who have spoken out. I want to particularly thank Ambassador Gilad Erdan and Cheryl Sandberg for coordinating today's event alongside the main sponsors, World Zionist Organization, Interwoven Shazor, National Council of Jewish Women, Schuster and Family Philanthropies, as well as many co-sponsors who have been mentioned. Those in this room today represent only a fraction of those eager to attend. We could have filled four more rooms in person, in addition to all those joining the live stream. The overwhelming interest underscores our collective commitment to believing and supporting women, including Israeli women, as well as our broader dedication to humanity. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the suffering and violence we're confronting today affects each of us differently. Should you feel the need to step out of the room, please do so. This past weekend, Jews around the world read the Torah portion recounting the rape of Dina. Among the numerous perspectives, one voice is notably absent, Dina's own. For generations, survivors of sexual assault have looked to Dina's story because it speaks so powerfully to the secondary trauma of being unheard, ignored, and reduced to a mere object for debate. And we heard this with new significance this year because Israeli women and girls were recently tortured, raped, and killed, forever silenced by Hamas. And when evidence emerged indicating the use of rape as a weapon of war by Hamas, the voices we expected to speak up fell into the loudest silence we could have imagined. When people use the language of feminism while brushing aside gender-based violence because of the identity of the victims, they're sending a clear signal that women's rights are negotiable, that rape is sometimes okay, that some women have more dignity than others. That is more than hypocrisy. It is a betrayal of all women. Because when our agency can be traded away, none of us are safe. Our work toward accountability, including by hosting this event, have already yielded results. This past week, the United Nations recognized the gravity of the sexual violence on October 7th. UN Women issued a statement just on Friday expressing their alarm for numerous reports of gender-based violence. But our work is not over. So we are here today to make sure the voices of Israeli women are heard. We are here today to bear witness. And we are here today to speak out. And that is why I'm so pleased to now introduce our keynote speaker, Cheryl Sandberg. Founder of LeanIn.org. Cheryl recently wrote a CNN op-ed speaking out for those who experienced sexual violence on October 7th and inspiring millions to join her in calling out rape. We are so grateful for her leadership and for her voice and for her friendship. Please join me in welcoming Cheryl Sandberg. And in the face of terror, we cannot be quiet. That is why we are all here today, to speak about unspeakable acts. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you to the amazing Sharia Cats for your unbelievable work getting us here together. On October 7th, Hamas brutally murdered 1,200 souls, and in some cases, they first raped their victims. We know this from eyewitnesses. We know this from combat paramedics. 
We would know this from some victims if more had been allowed to live. Maybe then one would be standing beside me right here to state something that should not need to be stated. Rape should never be used as an act of war. This truth must be upheld despite the politics of our time, because no matter what marches you are attending, what flag you are flying, what religion you practice, or if you practice none at all, there's one thing we can all agree on. There are exactly no circumstances that justify rape. None. Rape is targeted. Rape is terror. Rape is torture. But until recently, wartime rape was largely tolerated. If you think over our history, throughout the history of man, women's bodies were just considered part of the spoils of war. It wasn't until 30 years ago when the mass sexual violence of the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, the DRC, caused global women's organizations and human rights organizations to speak up. And in these halls, these halls where we are today, change happened. In 1993, the UN Security Council created the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia with an unprecedented commitment to prosecute rape as a crime against humanity. The next year, that same commitment was brought to the tribunal for, for Rwanda, and it has been seen many times since. None of these efforts have done enough to prevent wartime rape, not even close, but real progress has been made. That is why this moment is so critical. We have come so far in establishing that rape is a crime against humanity. And we have come so far in believing survivors of sexual assault in so many situations. That's why the silence on these war crimes is dangerous. It threatens to undo decades of progress, to undo an entire movement. The world has to decide who to believe. Do we believe the Hamas spokesperson who said that rape is forbidden, therefore it couldn't have possibly happened on October 7th? Or do we believe the women whose bodies tell us how they spent the last minutes of their lives? Who are we going to believe? Today, a new generation gathers. We gather in these same halls to reclaim our communal voice. I call on all women's organizations, every single one, every woman, every man, to unite by speaking out about these atrocities. This is as true when it's happening in Israel as in Ukraine, Ethiopia, Sudan, in any country. I especially call upon global political leaders to step up. We need to hear your voices saying loudly and clearly, rape is unacceptable. And then we need those words backed up with action. It's inexcusable when those who have the capacity to make a difference don't. We call upon the entire UN to formally condemn Hamas for these rapes, make sure there is a full and fair investigation and hold the terrorists accountable. The ground we have gained in protecting women was hard fought. It needs to be built upon, not lost. For over a decade, I've been urging women to lean in. Now I call on everyone to speak out. And if the world isn't listening to us, we're just going to have to speak louder. Anyone who 
as a mother, a sister, a daughter, a wife, or a friend should join us to unite against rape. This goes beyond politics. If we can't agree that rape is wrong, then we have accepted the unacceptable. Then the question will be, not what is happening in the Middle East, but what is happening to our humanity. And now it is my honor to introduce the Senator from the great state of New York, Senator Gillibrand. Senator Gillibrand has been a strong advocate for women her entire career. So when it came time to, her, to hold this event, it didn't surprise me that my friend and someone I admire so much continues to state unequivocally that any sexual violence against women is wrong and changed her schedule with very short notice to be here and give that voice today. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's very important that we are all here. It is very important that we are giving voice to the women who were raped and murdered on October 7th. It's very important that we are speaking truth to power at this time and in this place. I'm grateful for the leaders here. I'm grateful to Cheryl for your voice to take your platform to speak out so loudly and so boldly and so clearly is essential. I'm grateful for the ambassador, for your searing words, your absolute truth, and your unwillingness to accept silence from your colleagues at the UN. I want to thank Sheila and for the National Council of Jewish Women for standing so firm, for refusing to be silenced in this moment, and to bring the world community to bear. When I saw the list of women's rights organizations who have said nothing, I nearly choked. Where is the solidarity for women in this country and in this world to stand up for our mothers, our sisters, and our daughters? The horrific acts committed on October 7th by Hamas are truly indescribable. I've seen much of the raw footage. It takes your breath away and the sheer level of evil it depicts. You can't unsee when you see it and it haunts you like no other image you could ever see on a movie screen. The barbaric acts are acts beyond what we have seen from ISIS, Al-Qaeda, other horrific terrorist organizations around the globe. Witnessing people trying to behead people through many means is disgusting. Hearing the testimony about what has happened to women, the types of dismemberment the types of sexual violence to degrade them, to bring fear in their final moments, to bring fear in the eyes of those who had to witness the atrocities is unspeakable. While it is very hard to tell these stories, while some don't want to show the actual videos and pictures, we must demand it. We have to demand that people see what happened and to know it is truth. We collectively must 
ensure that the world knows the heinous, horrific, barbaric nature of Hamas's actions. We have to ensure that it is engraved in history for all time, just as when we go to see Yad Vashem and see the memories and the moments and the failures and the cruelty and the horror of what happened during World War II. One of the earliest images that we have been able to see is the attack, during the attack was that of Nama Levy. She was being dragged by her hair, her hands tied behind her back, thrown into a truck, blood streaming down her face, streaming down her arms, streaming down her back. Her sweatpants were covered in blood, streaming down her legs, clearly a victim of sexual assault. She was in terror. We've seen photos of bodies of all ages with unspeakable injuries. We've heard testimony of young girls being killed with their pants pulled down and naked, alone, afraid, and in terror. The mountain of, of evidence, forensic examinations, eyewitness testimonies from survivors and paramedics, video footage from Hamas itself, the words of Hamas declaring victory about the 10 people that he killed to his mother, recorded on his cell phone. It embodies a level of evil we don't see. It's hard to hear. It's hard to witness. The atrocities have evoked horror and despair. I can't imagine what it's like to be a Jewish family today, whether you're in Israel, whether you're in America, whether you're anywhere in the globe, watching this episode unfold in real time, knowing that it is just part of a long legacy of anti-Semitic brutality and inhumanity. For centuries, rape, sexual mutilation, sexual violence have played a grotesque role in the subjugation and suppression of the Jewish people. During the Holocaust, women and children were sexually abused, mutilated, and raped routinely. During the pogroms of the early 20th century, rape was used as the instrument of war. Even in the Renaissance, Italy, rape was used to extort money from families. Make no mistake, this is part of our global history. Rape's been used as a weapon of war for centuries, a deliberate form of torture that serves to dehumanize and terrorize not just the women, but the entire community. It's recently reared its very ugly head in the former Yugoslavia, where mass rape and sexual enslavement were used as an instrument of war. In Iran, the regime's security forces used rape and sexual violence against children in order to subdue women and the population as a whole. In Ukraine, overwhelmingly evidence shows Russian soldiers systemically using rape against innocent Ukrainians. This explains why the atrocities committed on October 7th and the international community's reluctance, even refusal to condemn or even acknowledge them, doesn't just strike fear in the hearts of Israeli women, it strikes fear in the hearts of every woman and girl around the globe. Their bodies are not worth defending. Their humanity is not worth protecting. The world community must do more. It must demand accountability for these intolerable crimes. The United Nations must denounce Hamas as a terrorist organization that uses rape as a weapon of war. The United Nations must live up to its purpose of upholding the principles of international law. And the United Nations must condemn these evil crimes against humanity.
Thank you so much, Senator Joe Brandt. I can tell you that my Kleenex pack was full before you started speaking. Thank you for your steadfast support of Israel and for amplifying the importance of why we are gathered here today. Next, we have a special message from Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton, who was not able to join us in person today, but she made sure to send her remarks in a video. I wish I could join you in person for this very important gathering, but I am honored to be a part of this effort to shed light on such a vital issue. As you well know, Many women and girls were attacked brutally by Hamas on October 7th, and they have testified to the gender-based violence that they both experienced and witnessed. As a global community, we must respond to weaponized sexual violence wherever it happens with absolute condemnation. There can be no justifications and no excuses. Rape as a weapon of war is a crime against humanity. Such atrocities have no place in any society or any conflict. Organizations, governments, and individuals who are committed to a better future for women and girls have a responsibility to condemn all violence against women. It is outrageous that some who claim to stand for justice are closing their eyes and their hearts to the victims of Hamas. But amid such inhumanity, we can also see women leading the way forward, as is so often the case. I have met survivors of sexual and gender-based violence all over the world. They are the ones who inspire me with their incredible courage and resolve. And I have seen firsthand that women are not just victims of war, they are agents of peace. That's why I champion Security Council resolutions recognizing the unique impact of conflict on women and girls and the importance of women in peacekeeping and security and mandating that peacekeeping missions protect women and girls from sexual violence in areas of armed conflict. You know, women on both sides of the current conflict in the Middle East have long worked for a just and lasting peace. I have grieved with Israeli women who have lost loved ones to terrorist attacks, but refuse to believe that peace is impossible. I have talked and listened to Palestinian women who have suffered greatly from the conflicts of the past decades, yet dream of a peaceful future and a state of their own. We honor all the brave women on the front lines of conflict by lifting up their voices and bearing witness to the crimes they have endured. I urge everyone present to make your position clear. We stand for the safety and equality of women, always and everywhere, from Ukraine to the Middle East to Sudan to the Democratic Republic of Congo, everywhere. And we unequivocally condemn the atrocities committed by Hamas on October 7th. We thank Secretary Clinton for her long-standing support. We now want to show you an excerpt from two interrogations of terrorists who participated in the October 7th massacre and were arrested by our forces. Notice how they describe to Israeli security agents the intentional violence and brutality they inflicted upon Israeli women. It is 
important to us that you also hear directly from Israeli first responder teams that have been working tirelessly on the ground since October 7th. With us today are three representatives who for days have been engaged in one of the most sensitive and difficult missions of all, sorting through remains of bodies in the multiple scenes of the massacre committed by Hamas terrorists. The people you are about to hear excavated the bodies, prepared them for burial, and conducted official investigations. Our first speaker in this group is Chief Superintendent Yael Reichert from the National Unit Lahav 433 at the Israeli National Police. The Israel National Police is leading the investigation of the murderous terrorist of Hamas ISIS who carried out the brutal attacks on October 7, 2023. The horrific and monstrous terrorist actions were committed against innocent civilians while they were in their home, dancing at the rave party, hiking with their friends and families on an early Saturday morning, without any distinction between babies, girls and boys, teenagers, women and men, the elderly, and more and more. The distinguishable and horrendous crimes, including the cold-blooded murder of over 1,000 civilians, IDF soldiers, police officers, and member of the security forces. The terrorists also made sure they did not leave any victim alive. Even while their victims were struggling and trying to run away for their lives, they engaged in the secretion and mutilation of bodies, including cutting off organs and burning them. The despicable terrorist, in a planned and methodical manner, committed a massacre against innocent civilians with no distinction between religion, race, or gender. A mass destruction of any living soul that stood in their way. A part of the overall investigation, the Israeli police is investigating sexual offenses committing against the victims. These are quotes from some of the testimonies gathered so far. A survivor from the Nova Rave Party testified, everything was an apocalypse of corpses. Girls without any clothes on, without tops, without underwear. People cut in half, butchered, some were beheaded. There were girls with a broken pelvis due to repetitive rapes. Their legs were spread wide apart in a split. A police officer testified, I couldn't drive because there was a baby cradle full of blood on the road. A baby that was outside his cradle and a naked woman lying next to the baby's body. She was naked, badly injured, bullets in her body. Another witness testified, many mutilated bodies in the head and neck area, heads crushed, the corpse of a woman with her jeans rolled down to her knees, heads without bodies. A witness from the rave party testified, we heard girls that were pulled out from the shelters, girls that shouted, they raped girls, burned them just after that. All the bodies outside were burned. 
a rescuer that arrived to a house on a kibbutz testified. Inside the shower, there was a body of a cuffed woman. She was without her underwear. The body was in the corner and her hands were tied. Another testimony from the rave party survivor. Women without clothes. Some without the upper body clothes. Some without the lower body clothes. Blood over the lower body. Everyone was full of blood. Butchered people. We found a woman's body dumped outside without pants, without underpants, burn, barely any hair left on her. I would like to show a summary of three testimonies we have gathered so far. The first is a rescuer who helped evacuate bodies from the Nova Rave party. The second is a paramedic who gave first aid. And the third is a survivor from the rave party. today. Next, you will hear from Shari Mendes. Originally from the United States, Mendes is an architect living in Jerusalem. She is a member of an Israeli Defense Force Reserve Unit that was established in the year 2010 by the Israeli Army Rabbinate to identify and prepare the bodies of deceased female soldiers for burial.
Good afternoon. My name is Sherry Mendez. I'm from Jerusalem, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak before you. I am an architect by profession, and also a member of this reserve unit within the Army Rabbit, and we are tasked to take care of all of the procedures that are required after a female soldier dies. <clears throat> our unit was formed as more women were trying to come into combat units, more female soldiers. In Jewish tradition, burial societies tend to be segregated by sex, with women tending to women, men to men. It is a gesture of respect for the deceased that their families know that women are present throughout the identification process and are in charge of the burial preparation of their daughters. I am going to tell you what we've witnessed at the Shura base where all the victims of the Hamas massacre were brought since uh, October 7th. I will neither overstate nor understate anything. I will just tell you what we've seen with our own eyes. Our main concern, especially in the first days, was identification so that families could be notified, and only then preparation for burial. I arrived at the base on Sunday morning, October 8th, and it was unimaginable in two ways. First, in scale, in numbers, in sheer numbers, when I got there, body bags were already piled to the ceiling, lining the corridors in every room. Refrigerator trucks were waiting outside, also full. Body bags just kept coming in all shapes and sizes. Many were oozing liquids and the floors were wet. The smell of death was already unbearable. It is impossible to overemphasize the number of bodies that we were dealing with, the sense of shock and despair. Our unit worked in shifts 24-7, carefully accompanying the victims, female soldiers in our case, as they went through the identification process, led by teams of medical professionals, dentists, and other experts. Bodies can only be prepared for burial once they have been 100% identified, so there's never any doubt. Teams have been and are still working at the Shura base around the clock since the war started. We are a small country and we all feel great responsibility toward the families. The second shock was the extent of the cruelty, the atrocities we witnessed. We saw victims were often shot in several places in the body and then many times in the head. Heads, heads and faces were covered in blood. They were shot in the eyes, face, and skull. Almost everyone had blood still dripping from their ears, noses, even days later. It was often impossible for families to be shown faces, and it seems as if mutilation of these women's faces was an objective in their murders. Some heads were bashed in so badly that brains were spilling out and had to be collected for burial. Jewish law requires that body parts be rescued and buried as much as possible. Even, but, even bloody clothing is buried with the body, even the cloths used to clean the blood. There were a lot of those. Some were shot in the head so many times at close range that their heads were almost blown off. In some cases, this was done after death just out of cruelty. How do we know this? Because the blood, there was no blood in the wounds. It had already, there was no more blood to drain out. These women arrived with their eyes opened, their mouths in grimaces, their fists clenched. The soldiers that we dealt with had expressions of agony on their faces still. I, I remember one young woman, a soldier, whose arm was broken in so many places that it was difficult for us to lay her arm in the burial shroud. Her leg, too. In her case, the entire left side of her body was shredded, torn apart most likely by a grenade. It is customary to place the dead in a pure white linen burial shroud, but often this was impossible, and we simply laid a white linen sheet on what remained. Many young women arrived in bloody shredded rags or just in underwear, and their underwear was often very bloody. Our team commander saw several female soldiers who were shot in the crotch, intimate parts, vagina, or shot in a breast. 
This seemed to be a systematic genital mutilation of a group of victims. Some bodies could not be recovered until later, as some southern communities were dangerous for days after October 7th. We saw bodies in advanced stages of decomposition, a terrible dark green color completely covered with large live maggots. On more than one occasion, we were told, run, get out, get out, get out. And you have to understand, we, we didn't want to leave. It was our job not to ever leave a person unattended. But we had no choice. Why? Because they said that bodies were coming in booby-trapped. All the staff at the morgue had to evacuate the building while corpses were checked by bomb specialists. Our unit has seen bodies that were beheaded or had limbs cut off, mutilated. One young woman came in with no legs. They had been cut off. We saw several severed heads, one with a large kitten, kitchen knife still embedded in the neck. Charred remains arrived and had to be identified and prepared for burial. These bodies were burned beyond recognition, often without arms or legs. They didn't resemble anything human. Our only means of identification for them was by DNA, and this is made incredibly challenging if there's no tissue when bodies are burnt badly. Sometimes we sifted through piles of ash that disintegrated as we touched them. These soldiers were burnt alive at very high temperatures. This is personal. I want to just tell you that these barbarians did not show these women any honor in life. But it was important to us and our teams, groups of women, that we show them deep love and gentleness as we prepared them for burial. We had more time in this burial room. It's just a room for us. It's not like the identification room. It was a room for women taking care of other women. We knew that we would likely be the last people to see these young women, and we held them in our hearts, even if just for a moment, as if they were our daughters. We really loved them. Finally, as a child of a Holocaust survivor, Finally, as a child of a Holocaust survivor, I understand the importance of bearing witness, and that is why I am here repeating these unbearable stories to you on behalf of my people and my country. I am here to be the voice of those who cannot testify, and I thank you so deeply for your time, your sensitivity, your trust, and your commitment. Thank you. Thank you, Shari Mendez, for bringing forward the atrocities that you have seen with your own eyes. And thank you for your work. Our next speaker, Simcha Greniman, is a volunteer in Zaka, a non-governmental rescue and recovery organization which volunteers around the world. He was one of the first responders who was sent to evacuate the bodies from southern communities in Israel. Sing. My name is Simcha Greenemann. I'm a volunteer in Zaka International Organization. standing in front of you today to, to tell the story of the horrific things that I saw with my own eyes and I dealt with my own hands from October 7. I was called down on October 7 to collect bodies and remains from the terror attack. One of the days 
I was called into a house. I was told there's a few bodies over there. When I walked into the house, I saw in front of my eyes a woman laying. She was naked. She had nails. And different She had nails and different objects. And her female organs. Her body was brutal. Her body was brutal in a way that we could not identify her from her head to her toes. She was abused in a way that we could not understand and could not deal with. The second body that we found over there was brutally abused in a way that we could not verify and understand and we even we couldn't even identify if it's a man or a woman different day I got a mission to go to, into another house I walked into this house into the bedroom there was a woman leaning on her bed she was half naked from her waist down she was shot from the back of her head. When we turned her around, she had an open grenade in her hand. Thank God, no one on our team got hurt. I'm standing in front of you, telling the stories of these women, these people that were brutally butchered, <laughs> killed in different ways. Hundreds of them in different ways were butchered and killed. And I dealt with a lot of them. My own hands, with my own eyes, I saw one by one. <coughs> I'm standing in front of you to make sure that you hear the voices of those women that cannot stand next to us now and be here to scream out what happened to them. Adonai oz la moiten Adonai evarech את עמו בשלום.
Thank you, Simcha. And thank you, Zaka, for what you're doing. We will now hear from Lino Abragil. Her Emmy-nominated documentary, Brave Miss World, delves into the heart-wrenching trauma of sexual assault victims around the world. Abragil has met with multiple women and encouraged them to stand against sexual violence by speaking out, as she herself has done, turning it into her life mission. Dear guests, my name is Lenora Bargill, and I am a rape victim. This title was forced on me on October 1998, a few days before another title, that of Miss World, was awarded to me. I was only 18 years old at the time. Twenty-five years passed since, and my crowning event became a vague memory. But I lived the rape I experienced every day, battling inner demons that, I tried, that tried to possess me, to pull me back again to the day I was abducted, brutally raped, and almost murdered. Since October 7th, I feel these demons raise their head, their chilling testimonies, the horrific videos of the atrocities committed to my sisters in Israel brought everything back. I feel their pain. I feel their insult. Their dignity shattered. Their lives taken. And the petrifying, utterly disgraceful silence that we have witnessed ever since. I remember the days I spoke up in public about my, my personal experience 25 years ago. I remember the warm embrace of the international women's organizations. I felt I had support, that someone believed me, that someone listened to me. Did this organization demand any proof then? Did they question my version? Did they ask to conduct a comprehensive investigation before jumping to conclusions? No. How convenient it was at that time for these organizations to use my name, my fame, to invite me to their conferences that are in word of their own, to take a photo with the woman who became for them a symbol, and how ashamed, so ashamed I feel that I was nothing but an extra in their production. Ooh. Why? Because today, in these conferences, they don't want to present the blood stains on the pants, the broken pelvises, the discredited bodies of my sisters, the bloodthirsty Hamas terrorists, even documenting their war crimes. And still, most of women organizations are silent. It took almost two months for the UN to publish this weekend, late at night, a weak condemnation. <coughs> the horrific testimonies we have witnessed so far, 
and which we have been presenting in this conference, should have awoken women organization long ago, long ago, and get them to stand up with us in solidarity. But so far, this has not happened because of their cowardice, because of petty politics. In the place I grew up, there is an old saying, sheket urefesh. Silence is despicable. The women who were raped and murdered on October 7th will maybe silent forever, but justice will be done. <laughs> Truth shall prevail. We will never forget them. And we will make sure that the world will never forget them. We will be the voice that was taken away from them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lenore. I would like to introduce our next speaker, Professor Ifat Bitton. He is the president of Ahva Academic College and head of the Israeli Academic, Academic Colleges Board. She is a legal scholar and activist for equality. Dear guests, I'm here today to speak on behalf of the silenced. Decades of researching and litigating for women in their most vulnerable positions have not prepared me for this current mission of giving voice to those who were silenced twice, not once. First on October 7th by Hamas and second by the silence of the very UN organizations that were entrusted with the mandate of protecting them. Hamas terrorists committed countless violations of international humanitarian law against <clears throat> Israelis attempting to demolish the Jewish people. They executed heinous war crimes and crimes against humanity. Their systemic and pre-organized use of sexual violence as a weapon of war was aimed to destroy our society through the bodies of women. The atrocious crimes perpetrated, filmed and distributed by Hamas terrorists, brutally assaulting and torturing women, girls, children and men can no longer be denied. On the other hand, the sexual assaults committed by Hamas are significantly more prone to denial and concealment mainly by silencing the victims, be it by the paralysis of trauma and stigma of survivors, by propaganda, or by murdering them. Practices of denying sexual crimes and not believing victims have long been condemned by feminists and human rights organizations. Feminist scholars worldwide criticize the ways in which liberal legal systems fail to provide women and girls with the protection they deserve, especially in cases of scarce direct evidence. These very practices are now held against our sisters. Not only they have suffered these atrocities, but they are also facing an outrageous demand to secure evidences from the battlefield. Already during the aftermath, and even though they are extremely low. I know first-handedly how overwhelming everything has been in the beginning, in the aftermath. I know, because on, on October 7th, I have lost my beloved two brothers-in-law who were heroically fighting against the Hamas terrorists, trying to save innocent civilians terrorized in their own homes. I have been closely watching identification processes 
and the unprecedented number of dead women, hostages, and survivors. These were red flags that led me together with other women specialists in Israel to focus more on investigating the gender-based crimes that were eventually revealed. We were determined to fight for justice on their behalf. Their unimaginable pain and suffering are now presented by those who bear, witnesses, who, who bear witness to the crime scenes, by the eyewitnesses that we've seen, and by the violated, murdered bodies. These evidence are in, incredible and in the sense that they are indications, all carrying the profound legal implications that are needed and that will allow doing national and international justice with these victims. The extent to which sexual assaults and rapes were committed by Hamas is already gruesome and much more remains to be revealed as the Israeli justice system is relentlessly investigating it. Your Excellencies, the world must unequivocally condemn these atrocities, siding with our victims of these gender-based crimes would not position you a step beyond siding with basic norms of justice. If you tolerate this, if we tolerate this, we tolerate the demolition of the building blocks of humanity. If you tolerate this, then your daughters, your wives, and mothers will be next. As I conclude my remarks, allow me to introduce the last speaker, Mandana Dayani. Dayani is a human rights activist, entrepreneur, and attorney. She's the creator and co-founder of I Am A Voter. An immigrant from Iran, Dayani lives in Los Angeles. She credits her experience in, uh, immigrating to the US as a religious refugee, as one of her most formative inspirations. gun pointed to my head. I was four years old. I was walking to the park with my mom in Tehran when the Islamic Republic's morality police pulled up alongside us. While their job was to monitor our hem lengths and our hair covering, their real job was abusing their power to deny women our rights and agency through deliberate acts of intimidation, dehumanization, and outright terror. I've never, ever forgotten the evil I saw in their eyes that morning. Even as a little girl, I knew a real life monster when I saw one. Today, the Islamic Republic of Iran that forced me and my family out of our homeland remains as oppressive as ever. And it is the same regime that funds the terrorist group Hamas. On the morning of October 7th, Hamas brutalized, bound, burned, murdered, beheaded, and sexually assaulted young girls and women in Israel. They raped young girls at a music festival and threw their dead, naked bodies into piles on top of each other. They raped women and teenage girls with such force and mutilation that medical examiners found them with shattered pelvises and missing organs. They raped the dead bodies of women they dragged women through the streets and paraded them as their conquests to cheering crowds. Rape was a premeditated, orchestrated, deliberate tactic of war. Monsters. As a feminist and activist, I have stood shoulder to shoulder with women my entire adult life. Women who look like me and women who don't. Together, 
We were the first to sign Me Too. We marched at the original women's marches. We advocated for the safe return of the girls kidnapped by Boko Haram. We joined the calls to end Asian hate and Islamophobia. We, can't, we supported Black Lives Matter. We campaigned for LGBTQ rights. We spent months protesting for women life freedom. We flew to the US-Mexico border to demand the reunification of families. We fought to protect our democracy. But then, on October 7th, I suddenly found myself completely alone. The champions I had stood next to so many times through so many injustices just disappeared. I was heartbroken and abandoned. Peers, friends, universities, and fellow leaders who still remain silent, you have made the deliberate choice to look the other way. You saw the videos, you saw the photos, many recorded and live streamed by the terrorists themselves on our feeds. You know exactly what happened to these girls and yet you turned away. You ignored our pleas to bring the hostages home. You didn't participate in our campaigns. You didn't hold signs, you didn't march, you didn't wear the t-shirts, you didn't sign the letters. When our women's mouths were bound and gagged, you chose not to be their voice. UN Women, it took you 50 days to condemn this gender-based violence and another seven to utter a single word about the terrorists that perpetrated them. When we commit to speaking out for women and girls, that means all women and girls. When we said believe women, we meant all women. So if you ignore the very clear and obvious violation of just these innocent women and girls, or worst, when you twist propaganda to dare justify it, then you are politicizing their pain you are denying their stories. You are stating that their rights are undeserving and that their suffering is unworthy of your protection. And you are complicit in emboldening their perpetrators who must be held to account. Showing moral leadership does not require you to just pick a team and ignore the brutal contours of the real world. Moral leadership does require you to see these women and all women. It is not your job to choose sides between them. It is your job to stand on their side. Now the United Nations has a very long history of singling out the state of Israel. But I am not here to justify the need for a Jewish homeland or defend its right, our right, to exist. Because this, today, these brave people before you, this is about the women and the girls. And for their sake, it is time that the United Nations opens its eyes and does its job. It is time that my fellow leaders It is time that my fellow leaders, activists, and communities that have still remained silent open their hearts. You must not turn away from women who have been raped and massacred in the most horrific fashion simply because you dislike their government. Why is it that you cannot summon up your compassion for them? Why is it that you cannot find your voice to speak up for them? What is it about these women and girls that makes them so unworthy of your otherwise limitless capacity for outrage, solidarity, and justice? Once again, I'm afraid the reason is quite simple. Because they're Jews. If that, 
If that is not the case, then now is the time to prove it. Join us. Speak up. Condemn the barbaric violence by Hamas against women and girls. I need you. We need you. These women and girls need you. As a child standing outside the park, I remember looking straight into the evil eyes of those monsters. I was terrified. I knew those men would get away with anything they did that morning. I knew I had to remain silent. But I don't anymore. And neither do you. Please. Please hold these monsters accountable. Denounce these war crimes. And always believe all women. Thank you. Thank you, Mandana Diani, for these important words. It is indeed baffling to see the striking difference between the staunch advocacy of women's rights across the globe and how Israeli women are somewhat, so, somehow left out of this same conversation. Some call it hypocrisy, and others highlight it with a viral hashtag now, me too, unless you're a Jew. Before we conclude the event, I would like to once again thank all the brave voices that you heard here today. And we would like to assure you that justice will be administered. I would like to bring to your attention, once again, if you haven't noticed, we will play it once again, the very powerful uh, artwork displayed on the screens. Before you entered, we will show it again, reflecting how October 7th moments have been inscribed into the collective national trauma. Mm -hmm. And I would like to invite singer Montana Tucker to perform the national anthem with us. Montana? Okay. Hatikva. Thank you. Color Well, hi. Thank you, everyone. This concludes our event. Thank you for being here today. <laughs>